we need to learn a, a technical tool that will enable us to manipulate uh, processes driven by Brian in motion and stochastic integrals. It's a famous, it's the famous Ito's rule or Ito's lemma. We, we really simply have to learn it. Uh, even, even traders, option traders, uh, need to know at least some intuition behind Ito's rule, Ito's lemma, for example, where they are interviewed for option traders' positions, not to mention quants on Wall Street. So let's go and do that. I'm going to, uh, this is going to be necessarily mathematical and somewhat abstract. I'm going to try to give intuition relative to the usual calculus. And also, let me first give you motivation why we need this. So here I have something called x of t, and then I have a function of time and of x of t. So think of x of t for our purposes as the stock price, and think of f as the option price. So the option price is going to be a function of time, actually usually time to maturity, and of the current value of the stock price. This is going to be the case in the black shops model. So this is why we need, if we know the dynamics of x of t, meaning we know this last term here, which is the derivative of x of t with respect to time, uh, can we say something about how f, the option price, changes with time, meaning can we say something about the derivative with respect to time of the option price? Okay. And here I'm doing it in standard calculus, meaning there is no randomness. Okay, so let's first look at the case with no randomness. And then there is, you may call it Newton's rule, uh, which, which is exactly this first equation here. In standard calculus, it is true that total derivative of a function which depends on time and then another function which, dep which depends on time. Okay, so I'm taking a derivative with respect to time, changing time in both places. That's changing time only in the first argument, so this is notation for partial derivative. Partial derivative means derivative with respect to the first variable, plus change in x, so partial derivative with respect to the second variable, x, times change of the second variable with respect to time, okay? d dt x of t. Okay, that this is something which, which simply comes from the usual Newton deterministic calculus. Okay? All right, with Brown and motion, this definitely cannot work in this form because if you have x which depends on Brown and motion, this doesn't exist. As we said before, the derivative with respect to time doesn't exist. So I have to, I have to be uh, flexible here in terms of how we interpret this. And formally, let me, base, let me multiply by dt to get rid of this dt, just kind of informally if you want. Uh, and um, I'm going to denote these partial derivatives with f subscript t, that's partial derivative respect to t, and then partial derivative respect to x is going to be f subscript x. Okay, so then I can write this as, think of this intuitively as change in f is f subscript t, so derivative respect to t, change in time, plus f subscript x, derivative respect to x, times change in x. Okay, that's just from here, cancel, you know, multiplying by dt if you want. All right, but that, that's, that's the way to write it. It turns out this is not quite true if x is random. If x is driven by Brown in motion, this is not quite true. There, there will be an extra term here. There will be an extra term which comes from the Brown in motion uh, properties. Okay. So let me now. So this is just to tell you what happens with the deterministic in the deterministic deterministic world. Let me tell you what happens uh, with uh, stochastic differential equations. So let me assume that capital X is my, let's say, stock price. It's a process such that change in X is some function mu of t dt 
plus some function of sigma of t change in uh, Brownian motion, dw of t, where mu and sigma may be random. Well, Ito's rule is, looks like this, the first few parts. So d of f of t of x of t, so change in option price if you want, given current time and current stock price, is the same term here, f t d t, same, the same term here, f x d x, but then I have a second order term, one half sigma squared, f second partial derivative respect to x, so f subscript x x, t x d d t, times change in time. Okay? There is this extra term which we don't have in the deterministic world. If sigma is zero so that we are back into the uh, deterministic world, this would disappear. But with sigma non-zero, we have this term. Okay? Uh, it should be really written, uh, be writing here sigma of t, it may depend on time and be random, but uh, okay, I'm not writing t here. If I don't write uh, arguments, uh, if and if I replace dx by, by what it is, dx is this, then I can write eta's rule in this form. So this is a nice form to use when you use eta's rule change in f is a combination of partial derivatives of f times dt, so ft plus mu fx plus one half sigma squared fxx, plus sigma first derivative fx dw. Okay? So this last line is obtained from this line by replacing, by substituting for dx this expression here. This is Ito's rule in its in this case, it's, it's a rule, okay? It's a rule that we will use as financial engineers, if you want, to get some idea how to price, how the option price behaves as a function of the stock price and of time. All right. All right, it's a rule, I'm just telling you, this is how it looks like. Uh, we will learn how to use it, but before that, if you need more intuition, or if you want some more intuition, mostly mathematical intuition, I'm going to give that in the next couple of slides. So, so this is to try to give a little bit of understanding why this is happening. And why, if he, why we have, I, this is if you are very familiar with the usual calculus, this will help you to understand why there is this extra term uh, when we do stochastic calculus. So let's do that. real reason why is the behavior of Brownian motion during very short time periods and when you add all the increments of Brownian motion over those short time periods. So really the variation in Brownian motion and in particular so-called quadratic variation. So generally a variation of order p or the pth power variation uh, is defined here. You split the interval 0 to t into pieces of length delta t, many pieces of the same length delta t, and then you look at the absolute value of the differences, increments, changes in Brown motion at the end of those endpoints of those intervals, put it to the power of p. Okay. So it turns out that for p equal to 2, when you let delta t go to 0, this this sum, it becomes a sum of infinitely many, infinitely many uh, terms, and it converges, it converges to t, actually. Okay? For Brownian motion, these quadratic increments, quadratic changes in the value across small intervals, they converge to t. And the first, if I put p equal to 1 here, the first variation converges to infinity. Brownian motion is so volatile, uh, varies so much, that its first variation explodes and goes to infinity. For smooth functions, for smooth fu uh, functions that have uh, derivative, which, is, which are differentiable, uh, it can be shown, uh, it's kind of actually relatively easy to, to see that, 
that it converges to the integral of the derivative of the function ds. Okay? But since Brownian motion doesn't have a derivative, it, it converges to infinity. Okay? But for smooth functions, the second variation converges to zero. It's not there. But for Brownian motion, the second variation is finite, but not zero. It converges to t. So this is essentially why we, have, we will have this extra second order term when we deal with Brownian motion, which we don't have when we deal with differentiable functions. Okay? The, the fact that these variations, second order variations, don't disappear. They don't go to zero when you add them up over small time intervals and take the limit. They don't disappear. They converge to t. Okay, so that's the essence of that. Let's see how that works for Ito's rule. I'm not going to give you a detailed proof of Ito's rule. I'll just give you the main idea. The main idea is Taylor's expansion. Now, if you remember or know about Taylor's expansion, this slide will make sense. If you don't know about Taylor's expansion, this slide is not going to be very helpful to you. All right, so Taylor expansion, Taylor's expansion says that change in f between t plus delta t, x of t plus delta t, and t, x of t values, okay, if I look at this difference when I move time from t to t plus delta t, that's equal to the first partial derivative with respect to time, f t delta t, then derivative with respect to x, f x delta x, then I'm going to take another second order term with respect to x, one half second derivative with respect to x, f x x delta x squared, plus some higher order terms. Okay. So the, the, the hard thing in the proof is to show that the higher order terms, uh, when you add them up or over uh, over all delta t's between some time s and t, uh, they, will, they will go to zero. Turns out for, for smooth functions also this term goes to zero. However, uh, because of what we argued in the previous slide, for Brownian motion, these terms, when you add them up, will not go to zero. Okay? So they will not go to zero. Uh, so let's compute formally this, uh, this delta x squared. So delta x, so here I'm using capital delta instead of dx because I'm thinking of discrete change rather than infinitesimal uh, change. So the, the change in x squared is mu delta t plus sigma delta w squared by my definition of x. Okay. So when I square it, I'm going to get mu squared delta t squared plus sigma squared delta w squared, and then the cross term is twice mu sigma delta w delta t. So these guys, when you add them up and take delta t, go to zero, these guys will go to zero because t is a differentiable function. This turns out also to go to zero. If you add these and let delta t go to zero, this term delta t will take over and uh, will uh, make this, uh, this sum of these terms go to zero. But this term, as we argued in the previous slide, when you add all these incre quadratic increments of Brownian motion, that doesn't go to zero, that goes to t. Kay? So this whole term, most of it goes to zero when you add, when you add them up, uh, except the contribution of this term, which will give you sigma squared dt. Kay? So in this sense, you we can think of dx squared as sigma squared dt. Okay, I, it's really, I mean, this is, this is waving hands, and it really means that the quadratic variation of this guy uh, is uh, sigma squared times t. If sigma squared is constant, otherwise it would be an integral of sigma squared over time. Uh, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. So going back to, to the Taylor's expansion, you have you have f d d t plus f x d x in the limit, and then you have plus one half f x x sigma squared d t. Okay, so this is this is uh, this is Ito's rule, and uh, basically it comes from the Taylor's expansion and then taking limits. 
um, well, also adding over all delta t's between two different times, uh, but but basic because we always think of this as an in an integral form, right? The, this is really should be in the integral form, which means adding over the over time. So uh, so that's you know that's the essence. If you look at the rigorous detailed proof of Vita's rule, the main idea is to tr st start this Taylor expansion prove that the higher order terms, when, they, when you add them up, go to zero, but these other terms don't go to zero. And you get this. OK, again, that's helpful only to those of you who have intuition about Taylor's rule or are, fa familiar, are familiar with the Taylor's rule. Fine. A little bit more in terms of maybe how to remember it, if you need to know it by heart, which you may have to know if you are doing a job interview, or say, on, on a, in a financial institution. So again, uh, this is helpful if you're familiar with the Taylor's rule. So you doing Taylor's rule formally here, df change in f is ft dt plus fx dx. That would be from first order expansion. And then the second order plus one half fxx dx dx. Okay? Or dx squared, if you want. So if you can remember, if it's easier for you to remember this, you remember this. And then dx dx, how do you compute dx dx? Well, you use the following informal rules. dt d times dt dt squared is 0. dt times dw is 0. And dw times dw is dt. Okay, These are informal rules. If you use these rules, you will get a correct expression for, for dx. What these mathematically mean really is that the quadratic variation of, of function t is 0. Quadratic so-called covariation between t and w is 0. And quadratic variation of w is t. That's what this means. Uh, but it's, it's just going to work fine if you use these, if you use these rules uh, and uh, compute dx dx, because then when you compute dx dx, you get mu dt plus sigma dw plus mu dt plus sigma dw. Everything will be 0. You'll have dt dt, dt dw, except sigma dw times sigma dw, which gives you sigma squared dt by this rule. Okay? So if you replace here sigma squared dt, and then dx you can replace by, by mu dt plus sigma dw, you will get exactly e to the rule. All right? So this is for those of you for whom it's easy to, uh, to remember this expression. And then if you also remember these rules, you, you'll get your e to the rule.